The uh, questions, you can submit questions at any time. Uh, feel free to uh, ask a question at any point. The beginning of the event will be a discussion uh, with our guests and our faculty here. And then we will consider the questions in the second half of today's hour. With that being said, welcome again. Uh, now I'd like to turn things over to Pat McFarlane in the philosophy department and Jim Keating in the theology department, the moderators for today's event. Thanks, Raymond. My name is Pat McFarlane. I teach in the philosophy department and in the program for the development of Western civilization here at Providence College. I'm joined with my colleague, Dr. Jim Keating from the theology department and the development of Western civilization program at PC. Uh, we also, Jim is also the moderator of the humanities program and I'm a committee member and faculty member in the humanities program as well. The forum's pleased to welcome to campus today, virtually, uh, our guest, Dr. Spencer Clavin. Dr. Clavin graduated from Yale University in 2014 with a BA in Classics and Classical Literature and holds an MA and PhD in Classics from Oxford University, uh, which was earned in 2019. He's won multiple prizes for translation and for his works in the and for his work in the classics, including something called the Black Belt Scholarship, which we hope to hear more of. Perhaps we can, uh, you can enlighten us about this. Mr. Clavin is currently an associate or an assistant editor at the Claremont Re Review of Books, a publication of the Claremont Institute. Uh, I have a copy of the Claremont Review of Books right here. It's a tremendous publication, po my favorite publication. Uh, I recommend it to everyone who wants to get and wants to feel the pulse of uh, politics and culture today in the United States. Um, uh, he's an assistant editor at the Claremont Review, and he's also the host of a podcast sponsored by the Claremont Institute called the Young Heretics Podcast, a podcast devoted to exploring, understanding, and enjoying the great works of Western literature. So welcome, Dr. Clavin. Welcome to Providence College today. Thank you for being here. Pat, thank you so much for having me and for that very warm welcome. It's a, it's a joy and an honor to kick this series off. And it's awesome that Zoom makes it possible to do this virtually. We're very happy to have you here, Spencer. Um, uh, we, the format is we kind of want to ask a, a few questions and see if we can get around eventually to the Iliad. But maybe you could uh, start us off here by talking a little bit about your own background and your educational background. and Maybe what got you interested in the classics as a field of study? Of course, sure. Well, it has a lot to do with Homer, actually. I, you know, I, I, I've been very lucky in a lot of ways, and I took a very, very roundabout course to my PhD in classics. I did grow up in a house full of books, which is kind of one of the, I think that's one of the great winning lottery tickets you can draw in life, you know, more than to be born into a wealthy family or to be born into a, you know, powerful family. If, if you're born surrounded by bookshelves, uh, you lucked out. And I lucked out. So I was always kind of encouraged to read the, I, the bookshelves in my uh, family home were kind of wonderfully just disorganized. So you would pull things down off the shelf and there'd be Dashiell Hammett and Tarzan next to Dickens and Proust, you know, so, um, and, and, and that was, in itself, uh, something of an education to kind of uh, breathe in. There's just this full scope of what was available uh, in terms of literature, and uh, so I, you know, that was that was just a part of my childhood growing up. But I remember very vividly the first moment that I kind of grasped that there was something called Western literature, and that I cared about it and wanted to know more about it. I was it was in sixth grade, uh, so I guess I must have been twelve. And I was lying on the floor of my grandparents' apartment in New York. We were visiting my grandma and grandpa who lived in Manhattan. And for a school assignment, I had to read the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey. And um, so, which is the other of the two Homeric poems. Uh, we'll talk today about the Iliad, but uh, the Odyssey is what I started with. And it felt a certain, there's a certain way in which these poems, these Homeric poems feel as if they've kind of dropped out of the mists 
of heaven. And, and actually, the ancient Greeks felt this way too, in large part because they, in, by the, about the 5th century BC, when a lot of the kind of high classical uh, writing is going on that we still retain from that period, uh, the Greeks knew much about as much as we do about how these poems were composed. And that is to say very little. We, uh, we're not even sure at this point, after however many centuries of scholarship, we're not even sure if these are poems written by one person or each poem is written by multiple people or what have you. Um, we know that they were sung originally, that they are a form of music, a form of oral uh, poetry and, and recitation. Um, but beyond that, they kind of come as if fully formed, like Athena from the head of Zeus, to use a, a classical metaphor. And that was my experience of the Odyssey. It was, it was like um, just encountering something that had been dropped into my lap from heaven. And, and I say that, you know, I, I wax poetic about that um, in a way that I would not have been able to do at the time. One of the things that I often remark upon, upon about my own connection to this literature is that I really couldn't have explained it to you for a long time. Um, and the word that I keep coming back to you to try and convey what it was that was drawing me in um, is richness. I talk about this sometimes on the podcast on, on Young Heretics, but it, it, um, this idea that you can sort of sense and you can develop your sense for when a book from any time period um, contains fertile soil that you can come back to that soil and out of it will grow new insights, new wisdom, new connection to the human race. Um, and, and that was the first time lying on my grandparents' apartment with the Odyssey. That was the first time I really felt it was Richmond Lattimore's translation, English translation. Oh. First time I really felt it. And I've chased that feeling basically ever since. Um, even through thinking that I was going to be an actor, that was kind of a, a career ambition for a long time. Oh. Um, and I didn't end up even pursuing that after, after college. I, I went, um, as you said, to, to Yale as an undergraduate and studied both theater and classics um, and had a moment sort of, of, of uh, disconnection from that richness for the first time ever when I took a year off to be in a singing group. And I thought this was kind of my practice run for being a performer. Um, and suddenly it was like I couldn't breathe. I mean, it was like there was no air in, in my lungs because there just that, that disconnection from the, the richness that I'd loved my whole life was gone. Um, and so that was kind of what prompted my decision to pivot to my other major, to do classics uh, long term and to pursue the career that I'm now pursuing, which is one of you know, public writing and speaking about this, this stuff, because I just knew that I had to have that in my life forever. I was, I was thinking about you know, other ways to describe, I sometimes talk about the, the treasure chest of, of the Western canon, that there's this giant vault, which belongs to everybody. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's truly, it's like free treasure. I think the Bible says something like, come, you know, you who are thirsty and hungry, come have food and drink without cost. That's kind of what this is. And um, so I, I was trying to think about sort of another way to get at this inchoate sense I have of, of the value of these texts. And I, I remember that in the Republic, so this is Plato now, uh, several hundred years after, after Homer, um, the philosopher Plato famously exiles the poets from his great uh, perfect civilization, his perfect republic. And I, I was sort of reading back through that exile that he pronounces upon the poets, even though he says he loves them. He loves Homer. He thinks Homer's great, uh, but they have to be kicked out. And the reason why is because people think they know everything. Uh, and this is what really intrigued me is the reason why the poets have to go for Plato is because they, they seem too knowledgeable. They seem, he says, to know every craft and know all there is to know, both human and divine, about both virtue and vice, um, which kind of tells you what kind of knowledge they're supposed to have, right? They're supposed to have this grasp of human nature, uh, and it's f the full panoply of it. And that's kind of perfect, even though it's viewed negatively in this funny text in, in the Republic. Um, it, that to me describes it exactly, and we'll hopefully talk about some of the major episodes in the Iliad that have this quality, uh, where you can re return to them and feel as if you're meeting living human beings who breathe and change with you over time. Um, it's very wonderful. Yes, that's, that's, that's certainly my experience of the Iliad. Uh, I read it, you know, we read large parts of it in our Western Civilization course year after year, um, and every time I'm struck by the vividness of the characters and their, their, their lifelike quality. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, can I just ask you really quickly, when you were, when you wrote your dissertation, what, what was your, what was your, what did you write on? Were you, did you write on Homer and Homeric poetry or was that just a, you don't have to answer at length, just sort of out of curiosity. 
Sure. No, it's a great question. You know, I wrote about um, Greek music, ancient Greek music. Um, we actually have music notation from the ancient world, something not a lot of people know, some of the most exciting and kind of underused evidence from the ancient world. And um, so I wrote at, at some length about ancient Greek music, which of course did touch on Homer because Homer sure. is music, but I was mostly interested actually in, in tragedy, in the music of tragedy. Wonderful. Incredible. Um, okay. How about we move the conversation to the Iliad? Sure. Um, uh, one of the questions we had uh, that we, we often bring up to our own students when we, when we speak with them each fall about the Iliad is it it's, seems to be when you first look at it, uh, an epic poem of war and mm. epic song of men in war. Uh, although there are incredible female characters in the, in the Iliad as well. Uh, um, but for the most part, a story of men in war, uh, but Paradoxically, uh, the, the hero or the, the central figure of the, of the epic, Achilles, seems to sit out most of the war. Well, he doesn't sit out most of the war. He sits out most of the action of the poem, I should say, <laughs> uh, the, last couple, well, the last part of the war, and for, for a couple weeks within the larger uh, span of the war. What do, you, do, you, do you have any sense of what, you know, maybe this is just a, a kind of general question. Do you have any sense of what that, what Homer intends to teach, what the poet intends to teach us by, by packaging this war, this, this epic war poem in, in such a way, or do you have any sense of what, what that's all about? You know, I think this is a really instructive question, a really uh, fertile question. And it's an old question. I mean, this is kind of one of the oldest and most enigmatic artistic choices in ancient literature or Western literature at all. Um, and, you know, Horace, the, the Roman poet Horace commented on it. It's part of where we get our idea of in huh. medias res, right? Beginning right. in the middle of a, a, jumping into the middle of a narrative. Um, and of course, as you, as you note, the Iliad begins not at the beginning of the Trojan War or its causes or, or what have you, um, but actually at the, near the end of this, of this 10 year war, they've been fighting for nine years um, when the poem opens. And my answer to, I mean, of course, this is be, being an old age old question. There are many, many wonderful answers to this question. Uh, so I will give you mine and encourage you to sort of encourage students who are listening to seek out others as well. Um, I, um, this is one of the reasons why I am a big, I really root for people to learn ancient Greek um, because it is such a, such a rich language. Um, and these poems in their original language um, will tell you more about themselves um, if you let them come at you with not the concepts that we build for ourselves in our minds using the English language, but the concepts that, uh, that existed in, in Homeric Greek. And, you know, I've titled this talk, Glory in the Songs of War. I obviously think this is a poem that is about war. And as you note, it's a poem that people associate, you know, think of the Iliad as the war poem and the Odyssey as not the peace poem, but the poem about home, right? The poem about domesticity. And, um, that is a modern, in some ways, it's a modern uh, choice to frame things in quite that way. Homer himself, uh, when he tells us what his poem is about, does not use the word, the Greek word polemos, war, um, but the word menis, rage, fury, just seething anger. Um, and that is a much broader category than war, than, than formalized uh, conflict between tribes or nations. Um, and another important sort of Greek word that comes up a lot as well and comes up early in the poem is eris, strife. Mm -hmm. um, and so these two concepts of uh, interpersonal conflict and just pure seething rage of, in many cases of the divine variety, um, but also of the very human and fallible variety are really kind of what this poem is about. And I think the re one reason for that choice is because Homer, the poet of the Iliad, uh, views rage as kind of the most, it's like the, the, the building block, the atom of human nature and experience um, that war dramatizes. Um, so, we, so we kind of begin with that awareness. And then we kind of, when you pull that camera back and you realize that that's what the poem is about, you realize everybody's angry. It's not just Achilles, it's not just the rays of Achilles, which is what is invoked in the, in the first line. Um, but of course, the gods get furious at one another. Um, Agamemnon, the king, uh, the leader of the Achaeans, the Greeks, is, is livid for most, for much of the poem, uh, with Achilles, and, and on and on. Um, so that's the, the kind of first thing. And then you then you sort of ask, well, okay, so 
what's the deal? Why is the way that this rage gets drawn? In a poem about war, why does um, Homer dramatize rage with kind of this removal of his main character from the fighting? Mm -hmm. um, basically, Achilles, it's been said somewhat wryly, pouts for like 20 mm -hmm. books. I mean, he, it's, in the, it's in book 20 that he finally gets back. Book 16, um, you know, is, the, is Patroclus and spoiler alert, the death of Patroclus. And then the, um, you know, there's kind of a, a long period of mourning and rearming for battle and a whole rigmarole um, before Achilles even gets on the battlefield. And that's when some of the fun, gory stuff happens, uh, although there's gore throughout the poem, of course. Um, and so why? I mean, one reason, I think, has to do with um, that word that I used, pouting. People accuse Achilles of, of being unfair here. I mean, what happens is there's a conflict over war prizes, um, right. part of the, you know, part of the way of doing war that makes us very, I think, my, my, makes moderns very uncomfortable in the poem is that women were traded as war prizes. Um, and, and so Agamemnon has to give up his war prize, um, Perseus, and so he takes uh, Achilles' war prize, Perseus. And that's the thing that sparks the whole conflict. Um, now, I really think it's actually unfair to accuse Achilles of being small-minded here. And I think that to do so kind of robs you of a deeper understanding of, of the poem and of the answer to your question, because the whole thing is framed in terms of Achilles' choice. There is a prophecy which is delivered to Achilles by his divine mother, Thetis, that his options are either to fight in, in the Trojan War and die an early glorious death and obtain what's called the kleos, the kind of glory of being sung about and, told, and have stories told about you. Um, or he can live a long and obscure life uh, at peace, uh, uh, you know, remove himself from the war and live a long life, but lose his chaos. Mm. Um, and that promise takes place in the context of the Greek vision of the afterlife, which is basically nothing. I mean, it, it's not entirely nothing. There are shades that wander about. Um, but uh, in fact, in the, in the Odyssey, uh, when Achilles sort of returns as a shade, um, there's a very bleak vision of what that's like. And so he's traded, he has not, you know, this is not a Christian worldview in which we can hope to expect kind of rewards, eternal rewards um, for our actions here on earth, but rather um, one in which the, the, what's to be gained is to be gained here and now in this vital earthly moment. Um, and, and so Achilles, it has to be understood, has traded everything to help the Greeks win this war. He's given everything away. Um, and, he, and the thing, the one thing he's getting in return is Kleos, his glory um, and reputation and honor among the Greeks. This is hugely important in, in Greek warrior culture to have honor. Um, and so when, he has, when he's insulted by Agamemnon, he effectively loses everything the second time over. Um, it's not a small thing at all to pout over. It's, it's, it's something for which one can understand his rage, even if we feel that we might not share it were we in his position. Um, and I, I thought actually that we might just read um, from the poem, the sort of Achilles' great apologia for this. Right. Um, this is book, book nine, um, it, where you know, they, they send an embassy to uh, Achilles. And the, the Achaeans do, because they're just, I mean, it's, it's a rout, it's a disaster without him, and they have to have him back. Um, and Agamemnon repents, he says, I'll give you everything back and more. Um, and he sends basically the dream, the dream team of like Achilles' best buddies um, in to, to argue for his return to war. He sends Odysseus, um, and actually this is Nestor, the wise counselor, Nestor's idea. Um, and so he sends Odysseus, the smooth talker. He sends Phoenix, the, um, the kind of uh, beloved counselor. Um, you know, it's really, it's, it, like I say, it's, it's the, the, the who's who of like good rhetoricians in the Greek army. Um, and they offer him everything and they say, please come back. We're dying out here without you. We're dying, man, uh, literally. And, um, and, and Achilles gives, to me, one of the most, still uh, after 2,800 so or so years of uh, Western literature, still one of the most complex, compelling kind of character speeches. Um, it's long, it's, it's quite lengthy, but I'm, I'm just gonna read a, a portion of it, um, in saying why he's not gonna take this deal, why he's not going back. Um, so if folks have read this or wanna go back and read it, this is in around lines sort of 300 in the Greek of the, of the poem. Um, and the, one, the first thing he says, one of the first things he says is, um, the same honor waits for the coward and the brave. They both go down to death. I'm reading here from 
the Fagels, the Robert Fagels translation. So that's the first sort of thing that he sets up is that uh, death, death awaits us all. This is part of the poem and it's the context in which he's making this choice. And then later on he says, you know, look, cattle and fat sheep can all be had for the raiding, tripods all for the trading and tawny headed stallions. But a man's life breath cannot come back again. No raiders in force, no trading brings it back once it slips through a man's clenched teeth. Mother tells me, the immortal goddess Thetis with her glistening feet, that two fates bear me on to the day of death. If I hold out here and I lay siege to Troy, my journey home is gone, but my glory never dies. If I voyage back to the fatherland I love, my pride, my glory dies, true, but the life that's left me will be long. The stroke of death will not come on me quickly. One thing more, to the rest I'd pass on this advice, sail home now. You will never set your eyes on the day of doom that topples looming Troy. So this is, a, a, again, a remarkable speech uh, containing pushback against some of the most sort of central uh, ideological uh, framework of the poem. You know, this war isn't, isn't worth anything. Death, death closes all. Um, but, but the point that I make, the reason that I raise this is only to say that the poem, uh, the, by, by taking Achilles out of the fighting and, and posing him with this question, what's better to, to live without glory or to die with glory. Um, it, it effectively dramatizes the very heart of what makes war so human and um, intense for individuals of this time. It, it carries forth not just kind of the fighting and the gore and the kind of drama of it all, um, but what war is sort of as a central, one of the two kind of central aspects of the human experience. It's very powerful. Yes, without a doubt. Um... You know, it, 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 of course, the image that for me sort of captures this, uh, that war is, is, a, is a terrible thing, but also sometimes a beautiful thing. Um, uh, the shield of Achilles, of course, mm -hmm. this great balancing of the, the, the cosmos is sort of a, a, a blend of these two. Uh, the peace and war are sort of opposite sides of the same coin and that, that, that they'll be both. Like the like the jars of Zeus, um, human life is a mixture of of both good and evil. It doesn't. It's not a, you know, it, it could be just all evil, but it, it'll never be all good. But it, it, the the sort of most you can hope for is this nice this balance of, of between good and evil. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, that sort of conflict will come, and a kind of um, there's a there's a ser there's a wonderful human humanism to that lesson uh, from the Iliad. Um, and, you know, the other kind of, you know, speaking of, of, of moving images or moving passages, uh, the one, the one, I mean, it opens, of course, it opens with that scene of ra with rage, which, which spreads like a plague throughout the Greek camp and even up into the heavens, like you say. Um, um, but at the end, you get this, this beautiful moment of reconciliation between enemies, um, uh, between Achilles and, and Priam. Uh, which sort of is a nice, co a nice is, a, is an incredibly beautiful way to close this this story of war. Um, that's one um, one moving scene, I think. The end, the the final scene between Achilles and Priam, uh, in a poem full of moving scenes. Is there is there any scene in particular in the poem that you find particularly uh, that strikes you as a moving? I mean, there are many, but but is there one in particular that you that that's always speaks to you in some way well i'm i'm really glad that you brought up the shield of achilles this is right this is uh book 18 and, and it was almost on my mind to you know you, you took the words out of my mouth because i think that is absolutely where this is localized the city at peace and the city at war that the the great hero finally makes his decision he goes back he's carrying on his arm this kind of image of uh how human life in the this uh, heroic Greek mindset takes on its meaning, that, that peace kind of is understood through the lens of war and war is understood through the lens of peace. Um, and and we, we, we cherish uh, the richness of life. We cherish the, you know, there's, there's fields being harvested in the city at peace. There's, there's court cases being argued. There's all just the whole, the full panoply of life. We cherish that uh, because we see next to it, the kind of chaos that waits at its gate and risks that have been taken to sort of found civilization and to protect civilization. Um, I'm going to come, uh, this is going to be a roundabout way of saying that my favorite scene in, in the Iliad is on the shield of Achilles, but uh, I'm, 
I will first though cheat because this is, this is, you realize I'm sure like asking me to pick my favorite child. And, um, and, and one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning is you come back to these scenes again and again, and they always, something new strikes you each time. Some, something um, that you hadn't noticed before about just how human, something that you've experienced that you can now bring to the poem and understand that is what it's like to leave, to have to leave a lover. And I'm thinking here of book six, the, the um, interaction between Hector and his wife Andromache, who pleads with him not to go. Um, his son, uh, Astyanax, plays with the, the um, or rather recoils from the helmet that he's wearing. And then he takes it off and his son is able to kind of uh, engage with him. So there's profoundly human kind of close-ups, freeze frames uh, right. on, on dramatized um, emotional interaction, which again is why I think it's so, so smart of Plato to, to kind of make it about, to say that it's about character. It really is what it's about. Yeah. Um, and you mention another greatest hit, certainly uh, in 24, the interaction between Priam um, King Priam of Troy and Achilles, because uh, now Hector, again, spoiler alert, now Hector, the, the great valiant hero of the Trojans is dead. Um, the war is, you know, is all over, but the shouting effectively, that's been the device, decisive battle. The, the, the poem doesn't end with the end of the war, but it ends basically with our awareness that this, um, really in, in, it, tragic in the true sense of the word, this, this tragic conflict is drawing um, to its conclusion. And we have a, this, this shocking, it's important to understand about that scene, I think that just how shocking it would have been um, to a Greek to see or hear about an old patriarch, the kind of father of many great princes, um, beseeching a young man, clasping his knees and, and, and weeping, um, begging for the body of his son back. Um, and of course, the, always the unexpected moment with Homer, of course, the, the great unexpected thing is that Achilles weeps too, because he remembers his father at home. And, um, and that is, you know, when, when you say that this is a poem about war, I think people sometimes think, well, then it's going to be a kind of celebratory, jingoistic, rah, rah, you know, and there's, there's lots of um, excitement in it. Uh, but this is not a poem that's blind to the costs of war at all. It's, it's, it's intimately aware of the human uh, suffering and, and the, the poignancy of, of these, some of these interactions between people that, you know, Priam and Achilles have no beef with each other, so to speak. Uh, the whole thing starts because Menelaus' wife is stolen. This is, a, you know, these are, um, and, and this is a famous lament about war, that this is basically rich kings sending um, innocent people to die on their behalf. Uh, so there's, all of that is there in the poem. Um, but, uh, and this is the one that just always wins the prize for me, because you, as you say, you could go on and on. There's so many of these, and each one is different. It sort of strikes you at a different time. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in book 18, when there, we have this lengthy ekphrasis, this description of this uh, shield of Achilles, um, there's a harvest scene in the city at peace. And in that harvest, the young boys and girls are carrying in the fruit, uh, carrying in the produce from the harvest. Um, and they're accompanied by the singing of a young boy who sings... Um, it's called a Linus song. He said, and this, you know, I mentioned that I studied music and yeah. um, as a graduate student. And um, this is one of these mysteries. Uh, we think it probably has something to do with a, with a God of the harvest who's, you know, who dies each time the harvest uh, comes. Uh, there's kind of this idea of cyclical seasons coming back. Um, and so he's singing this song that kind of evokes the fact that when, when you pluck the fruit, um, you've also then, you know, set yourself on the path to the fruits being eaten and with, or withered, and, and that, that you know the onset of summer is also the kind of herald of, of winter. Um, mm -hmm. So this, just in that one word, we think uh, there is this kind of uh, evocation of that. Uh, but the description, and this is really a place where where um, Fagel's, in my opinion, shines as a translator. Um, but I'll just uh, I'll I'll find it here for us, um, and then read my just the most powerful image I think in for me.
<laughs> I think you're still on mute, Spencer. <clears throat> well, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Well, it wouldn't be a first Zoom <laughs> conference without at least one technical difficulty. I thought we were doing so well. Um, we, were but... <laughs> we were doing great. It's okay. It's okay. I thought it was on my, I'm like, oh gosh, now what happened? I don't know. Did the power go out or something? But okay, good, good. You're back. I'm back. Yes. That's the important part. Right. I couldn't, I can't tell what happened actually, but at least we hope it won't happen again. Um, where was I? Was I in the, did you hear, was I, had a, was I in the middle of the passage that I was reading? Right before it's, right before you started. So you can start right at the beginning again. That'd right. be great. Okay. So leaping back in here to book 18. Um, the, this is the shield of Achilles and the, the, the image of harvest that Hephaestus, the God carves on the shield. He says he forged a thriving vineyard loaded with clusters, bunches of lustrous grapes in gold, ripening deep purple, and climbing vines shot up on silver vine poles. And round it he cut a ditch in dark blue enamel. And round the ditch he staked a fence in tin. And one lone footpath led toward the vineyard, and down it the pickers ran whenever they went to strip the grapes at vintage. Girls and boys, their hearts leaping in innocence, bearing away the sweep right fruit, in wicker baskets. And there among them, a young boy plucked his lyre, so clear it could break the heart with longing. And what he sang was a dirge for the dying year, lovely, his fine voice rising and falling low as the rest followed, all together, frisking, singing, shouting, their dancing footsteps beating out the time. Hmm. So this is, I mean, one of the sort of things about exorcist that people sometimes have to get used to is that as you describe the still image, it sort of sort of comes to life uh, in the, it, under the poets, uh, in the poet's words. But to me, there's just a, there's a, a kind of untouchable genius about this passage. It's so tender. Um, Atalea Froneontes is what he says about the, the boys and girls carrying the fruit that they're, they're thinking tender thoughts. Um, and, and so there's, there, it, it, and it's so vulnerable yeah. Um, just this in the middle of this story about war that's been gory like you wouldn't believe um, and this terrible choice that's been made by this big brawny hero um, and I think that the poet I, I, I always hesitate to say that there's a self-portrait here because that's uh, too simple um, but I think the poet puts so much of himself into this mm -hmm. moment um, the person that watches the living and the dying of the year and touches on so many of the themes that we've talked about today in our conversation. Um, so I, I never get tired of that passage. That's a beautiful passage. I, I, I don't think I'm quite, I mean, I, the shield, of course, with the scenes and, and the, I don't think I quite um, appreciated the tenderness of that scene. I, I didn't, I didn't quite remember that part about the, the liar being plucked at the end. It's beautiful. It's, it's just beautiful. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe that that, <laughs> it's hard to, for me, it's hard for me to believe that that was written by a committee or, or by a community, <laughs> of bards, a community of bards over the years. That's, to me, that sounds like the image of a, of a man quite in control of, or a poet, I should say, a poet quite in control of his material and quite uh, a genius, a, a genius of, of a sort, you know? You know, I want to say about that, the, the Homeric question it's called, right? Who, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm on your side of this. I'm yes. with you. Yeah. Um, I think it was one guy, basically. Um, and, and I stipulate when I say that, that, of course, in oral tradition, one of the things you do is you hand stories down, you, right. there are little snatches of things, all even, you know, the most literary written poet you can imagine, um, has borrowed big chunks from previous authors yes. and is one-upping people. I'm yeah. sure Homer's one-upping people we've never heard of and never will know about in, right. in works. Um, but one of the things I note is that even uh, separatists, uh, even analysts, I believe they're, they're called in the scholarly literature, um, who like to kind of chunk up these little 
um, portions of of the poem and say this was written before this part and so forth um, usually end up positing some kind of editor some kind of very successful skillful um, yes. person that puts it all together and um, which to me amounts to the same thing it amounts at least to recognizing the quality that you're describing yeah. which is the, the artsmanship the craftsmanship that, yeah that has to be I, I just it just seems to me so true it just it just grabs you in moments like that there's a there's another there's a moment in book nine before before these before the um, embassy shows up to Achilles tent where he's playing the liar mm. and singing the songs of heroes, uh, singing the old so the old songs of heroes in war, um, and that that always struck me as a as a kind of a, a Homeric wink that that he that that he in that moment Achilles is like a like a Homeric like a bard of, of some kind, but he's singing, he's singing the old fashioned stories of heroes in war. And he, at that ironic moment, he's, he himself is a hero out of, out of the fight. Uh, so that there's something, there's something new going, and there's some, something, something different going on with the Iliad and how it, how it stacks up against the old kinds of war tales that were told. I, I'm thinking more like a, like a, the uh, the old stories of of a clear where the, where the enemy is the enemy and the and the heroes are the good guys and that's the way it is and this is a celebration of that war into something quite different uh, a, a tale quite different in the Iliad. Well, he, yeah, I mean that's that's a wonderful uh, her parallel passage to invoke. He's what he's singing there in the Greek is Clea Andron. He's singing, and that's Clea is the plural of Kleos. So this right. is singing the glories of of men. Um, which means exactly, as you say, that they, these are heroes who are operating uh, in a context where they know that poems like the Iliad get sung and composed. And of course, the poet is basically like auditioning there for the person who won Achilles his fame, for the guy that basically delivered on the promise of the gods. Uh, to Achilles, that if he died gloriously, he would have fame forever. Um, and and the, every time you read that, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, because here we are in 2020 reading right. this poem. That's exactly, of course. Um, you know, I wonder what you might think, um, what, what, you know, uh, on that last thing you said there, why, why we might still read. Um, oftentimes, um, students will say, well, why are we still reading this today? What are we, what are we, what do we hope to get from reading this old poem, this ancient poem? And you know, like a, as as many of my colleagues know, and as I do often, I I often say that just because something's old doesn't mean it doesn't have anything to say to us, or that it's outdated, or or you know that's this this kind of a typical teacher sort of saying. But um, what do you think the Iliad? Do you think the Iliad has things to teach us even today? E even so many. I mean, we I mean we've talked about what a beautiful work of art it is, just a, in terms of a human genius. It's a, a tremendous literary treasure and work of art. Um, um, you know, it occurred to me this morning, given the anniversary of today, 9-11, um, just how much we, even in these days, rely on the heroism of people to, to go into buildings and, uh, uh, or to risk their, put it all on the line to, to, to save others, uh, or all the different heroic things that all the you know her heroism is thrown around a lot these days, but as a term, but but there is still this this. Uh, anyways, the the bravery, courage, manliness, heroism, those things don't seem to ever go out of style, and so to that small extent, uh, there's a case I think that you can make for reading the Iliad even today. But is there is there more? I'm sure there's more we can say about it. Do you have any thoughts about? what the Iliad has to say to us even today. Well, you make a, a beautiful connection to the day and the occasion. Um, I, I assume it's kind of happenstance that, that we happen to be talking. It is, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's um, but, happenstance, yeah. Providence, we say around here. <laughs> as it were, right, yes. <laughs> well, I see what you did there. Um, well, you know, um, I, I think it is Providence, and I'm glad that you raise it, if only because it's it's fitting to you know pause and, and commemorate the day uh, and and it's how uh, solemn and momentous it is in all of our um, memories, those of us who lived through it. And the note that you strike seems right to me. It's this when I talk about 
peace taking its meaning out of war because we understand it when we understand you know what 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 we could lose um and and what it takes as you say in in the the courage and the virtue and indeed the manly fortitude that it takes to defend um a civilization against attack um that's a moment when i at least as a young boy um suddenly reckoned with that for the first time, never having done so, never having been confronted with the realities um, of, of war and, and, um, and the pain and the suffering that it brings. Um, so that's certainly, I think, one uh, eternal truth that we were reminded of, we are reminded of on this day. Um, I will say, and this is kind of going to be a funny roundabout answer again to your question, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendously newsy moment right now. I, we're having this remote conference because we've just uh, we've been through uh, a pandemic uh, and because, you know, and, and of course we've had tremendous civil unrest this summer. It's, it's, it's been a big summer for news. Um, and when you sit down after such a thing to um, read a 2,500 year old, 2,800 year old poem, um, there's an immediate kind of question, well, what, why are you doing that instead of investing yourself in the, what's going on instead of uh, paying attention to the world? And there are two, I think, mistaken impulses that arise out of that question. Um, one is to jettison the ancient works, uh, as you alluded to, to jettison them mostly on the basis of their incompatibility with our own values, that we look at them and we say, well, they didn't think the same way. They think in some cases they think in, let's just say it, abhorrent ways to us yeah. about um, gender or some, you know, pick your, pick your issue. Um, and so we throw them out on that basis. We say they can't have anything to teach us because look how backwards they are. Um, to which of course the answer is that, you know, <laughs> in, in large part, if we have gained a moral sensibility, which enables us to uh, recoil at certain aspects of the ancient world. It's precisely because of many hundreds of years of reading and retaining the great texts of our tradition that we gained that sensibility. Sure. And so, you know, it's the same, it's the same when, when you look at uh, episodes in the Old Testament and you say, this is awful. How can the, you know, Israelites have been asked to do this by God? Well, one of the reasons you think that is because you've read the Bible and because you, you stand at the end. So there, so there is this incoherence, I think, to rejecting old works on that in those terms. Um, but the other mistaken temptation, I think, is to hunt desperately for relevance, as if uh, should these texts not furnish some exact parallel with our moment, uh, they will have failed us and cease and have outlived their usefulness. Um, but of course, you know, the answer to the question, what does Homer have to say about coronavirus, for example, is in some respects precisely nothing uh, because there was no such awareness of coronavirus at the time. Um, and and so, so, we, so we shouldn't ask, I think, for these direct correspondences that sometimes get trotted out, you know, oh, such and such a thing is literally Weimar Germany or it's literally the French Revolution, these, these yeah. exact parallels. Um, of course, having said that, I'm now going to pivot and say um, that what, what they actually have to teach us about our present moment is everything because the, the, in order to um, grasp what they have for us, we need to reckon, um, scrape away the kind of historical detritus and reckon with um, who the people are, what they are like, how it can be that we can relate to them in ways that should, you know, if there's no consistent human nature, it shouldn't even be possible to, re to, to relate to Hector and Andromache on the wall in the way that we do. Um, so, that, so there's that much of it. And then asking the kinds of questions that I've just articulated about moments that we do find abhorrent. Well, why? Why is it that, um, why is it that Odysseus in book two of the Iliad um, doesn't have a problem marching through the ranks to keep them in, in line and speaking kindly to the uh, noblemen, but beating the underclasses, right? Why is that that, that seems perfectly valid to him and, and <laughs> not to us, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and so even the places at which we do recoil from the, this tradition um, are, are instructive because of course, somebody had to come along or some development had to happen between us and them uh, that makes us feel that way. And we'll learn more about ourselves that way too. But ultimately, I think what you're saying is the heart of it, the essential, the urgent parts of our human nature, um, the, the things that seem to go away for brief moments and then never do, like war, um, right. things that we always think are kind of at the door or gone, um, and then they come back. You know, if, if, we, if we aren't reckoning with those things, then we will be taken by surprise when right. they revisit us.
Right. Um, yeah, you think about that in particular uh, on, a, on a day like today. Uh, the that you know, <laughs> in in 1989 with, with this famous the famous the famous idea that history had somehow come to an end and that mm -hmm. we we we'd settled on capitalism and liberal democracy as a sort of as a sort of apogee of human development and then as many people said when September 11th happened you know history came back again and and was back and you know it, it wasn't over it's not it's not over. Uh, it's never over and it's never far from us. Uh, so um, uh, it's always going to be relevant in some way, uh, this, and, you know, the other, the other thing I was thinking about in terms of uh, its relevance for today, to, to the extent that that's even a good question. Um, I, I think, uh, and I have a question here actually from a, from a, uh, from a, from a, from a student here that I'll, I'll be happy to share with you here in a minute. Um, I think there's no more important value today than courage. Mm. I think that we sort of lost track of the virtues in general, but I think the virtue that might be the most important for our own age is courage. Uh, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Let me let me uh, turn to this question here from one of our students, um, and maybe the last ten minutes or so we can just have you answer a couple questions from our students, uh, and then we'll we'll wrap up and 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 wish you a happy weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and wish everyone a happy weekend. Um, here's this. Is, is Achilles' iron-heartedness or hard-heartedness an important theme in the poem? Is his, uh, that's just, that's the first part. And then the second question is, is his receiving of Priam's supplication a kind of high point or even a very high point for Homer? Mm. So the question about iron-heartedness or hard-heartedness, mm. and then the question about the, the end being the high point. That's a really perceptive question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I like that question a lot. Um, and we've touched on some of the themes that will inform my answer, of course, uh, during our conversation. Um, I think, though, that something else that can be said here is this is a good example of a place where um, the interposition of Christianity has so reworked our consciousness and our moral intuitions um, that we find it hard even to think ourselves into the head either of Homer or Achilles. Um, the idea that stubbornness or iron heartedness or hard heartedness might actually be a virtue um, as contrasted with soft heartedness, which is of course a great Christian virtue, the ability to be easily affected um, by the suffering of the weak um, is a central Christian virtue. And there's a wonderful book called Dominion by Tom Holland, um, uh -huh. which is about this basically, about the, the, the kind of revolution that occurs, not just in practices or in religious ideas or in um, politics, but in um, trained moral reactions, right? Uh, our, our, our intuition about whether we praise or blame somebody. Um, this is a good example of that. Achilles is stubborn um, and I think we're supposed to admire him for it. I think that the, um, the, it's a mistake to say, you know, what a, uh, what a callous person, except from our own perspective. Um, right. From Achilles' perspective, uh, that is exact. And from, I, I believe from the audience, the intended audience's perspective, um, he's holding fast against the temptations of material wealth uh, in the face of his honor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, great. How about, how about another, another question? Um, this is a, this is one I think is sort of interesting. Was the Iliad like a scripture for the Greeks in ancient, in the ancient world? Did they read it and meditate on it? Like we do the Bible. <laughs> mm. That is a good question. Uh, and I'm, I have myself made this comparison sometimes. Uh, yeah. and I, yes, I, I think it is an inexact comparison, but a, a, an informative comparison. Um, Greek religion, uh, which is a, a misleading word even to use. It's a, a Latin uh, inflected word that we have as really as, you know, Christian, as inheritors of Christendom, we've kind of developed this idea um, that there is a set of things called religion that can all be bundled up. Your practices, your beliefs about God, um, the way that you think God wants you to behave. Um, that's not what we're dealing with, with Greek religion. We're dealing uh, with, a, with a kind of pervasive set of ideas about the whole world, which includes gods, that includes uh, metaphysical forces and, and uh, anthropomorphized uh, sort of forces. Um, and and there's, there is therefore no authoritative scripture. For right. um, it's not like 
here's what you need to know. Um, and, you know, that's obviously a simplified way of describing Christianity too, but it's not like, here's the book, you know? Right. Um, and so on the, in, in some ways, the Iliad and the Odyssey, especially for Athenians, um, after the, uh, what's called the, sometimes called the Pisistratid recension, the reign of the, of, um, the Pisistratid kings um, before the sort of flowering of democracy, uh, the Pisistratids were very into making Homer into the kind of Athenian uh, guy, even though he's very Panhellenic, he, he sort of speaks about all of Greece. Um, but after that period in sort of the sixth century BC and onward, this, these texts become taught, they're taught in schools, they're cited to settle philosophical arguments the way that you might uh, cite a, a scripture to, to kind of make a point. Um, they're, they're all throughout Homer and or they're all throughout Plato rather, and indeed Aristotle, who's not the person you would immediately expect uh, to kind of cite the poets, um, but he does. And that's part of what I think Plato is playing with in the Republic when he says, people think these guys know everybody. Well, he, you know, is as guilty of that as anybody. Um, and, um, so there is that element to them. Now, one important stipulation and one thing that can help us, I think, to not recoil as Christians from this poem um, is to understand that they are not scripture in the sense of having been viewed as authoritative about the gods. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they were questioned very intensely uh, mm -hmm. for their portrayal of the gods as perhaps too human uh, and too fallible. Um, so, so we're not looking here at like, this is what the Greek gods were. It's much more complicated than that. But right. as, as a cultural authority, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was even, I was looking at a, at a passage of all things in, in, in Aristotle's, <laughs> in Aristotle's uh, book, uh, his his great book on on natural history called the the history of animals. Mm. He, in a discussion of the of the blood vessels and their their course in the human being, he cites he goes through all these different predecessors of his. But then he says, well, Homer only thought there was one blood vessel, and he cites this 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 uh, fight passage from the Iliad where it talks about someone getting their head chopped off or something. Oh, yeah. So so he even said. Strangely, he even he he cites Homer as a sort of you now Aristotle's prone to doing this, citing citing different people's authorities. But even for something as as remotely away from from theological things as as the human anatomy and physiology, he's Homer is still cited as sort of having is is at least worth mentioning that he talks about the blood vessels in some way. I, I thought it was sort of a a, a crazy thing. Um, Okay, how about one more? It's, we've got about five minutes left. Um, you, you've spoken a few times about the intended audience of the Iliad. Who, who do you think was the intended audience of the Iliad? Uh, was it, you know, we often hear, or some people speak the, of, of, a, of a crowd of aristocrats maybe, or uh, it's being sung maybe at symposia or, or another venues. Who do you think in Homer, intended the audience to be for his poetry? Well, the information that comes down to us about this is very scant. And um, that is one of the, <laughs> I kind of think this is also providence. Everybody laments our lack of knowledge about Homer, um, but we don't know very much about Shakespeare either. And I think that saves us from making kind of facile uh, analyses of his plays that have to do with like what his father did for a living. And not that people don't try to pull that sort of thing, but I, I think that um, on some level, our, our uncertainty about Homer contributes uh, to our appreciation of his poems. Um, but that having been said, we would sure like to know the answer to this question. Um, we know an awful lot about, not an awful lot, but a fair amount about the process whereby these poems were transmitted um, after their composition. Uh, there was a, a family or a, a, a group, um, a clan, whatever you want to call it, of bards called the Homeridae on the island of Chios, um, who considered themselves both descended from Homer and, and responsible uh, for uh, the preservation of his work. And then as I, as I noted, um, their festival culture was a big part of this. So by the sixth, sixth century BC, we know that people are reciting these at mass gatherings and mm -hmm. that at that point the intended audience is a civic gathering um and the class dynamics of that are a bit also kind of shaky for us we don't know for example how in what context women might have heard this poem um and 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 you know in what context it would have been only men uh however 
Um, even that is later than what we sort of vaguely think of as the eighth century date of composition of these poems. Um, we know we can infer some things from the uh, structure and style of them. They are very long. They take, it would take, you know, three days to, to sort of fully uh, recite them if that was what was being done. And um, you would need bathroom breaks, you would need food, you would need all kinds of resources. So, so probably not then just we're all, as they would later do in, in what's called the symposium, sort of sitting around over drinks and citing a few lyric poems, perhaps, uh, probably not looking at that, probably looking at something more of an event. Um, oh. And, and I, you know, the, these monumental oral poems are sort of always, I think, like that on, in some level. I, I'm working now on, on Beowulf and, and it has that sense too, that this is, would be not just something that you would kind of casually go through, um, but something you gather to do. Um, so always, I think it was, a, there was a production, a sense of production about it. Um, but more than that, yeah, we, we'd be guessing. Yes, yes. You know, I'm so glad you made that point about Shakespeare. I never quite thought of it like that, but I think that's, I think that's really, I think that's a really nice way of putting it. It's nice that it's nice how little we know about them. So those sort of questions, even though, it, it, you know, I can see people, I know it's, it's important to some people and, and maybe it's important in general, but it is nice in the way in which uh, you can focus less on the author and more on the substance, uh, less on the personality behind the thing and more on what the, what the poem actually says. Mm. I think that that's a, that that's sort of a you know blessing in disguise, uh, but it's a it's a nice way of it's a nice way of looking at it. I, I like that very much. <laughs> well, it's in in any other case, there is I think a very interesting question about the relationship between the author and the text, yeah. and then how much we should care, right? Yeah. The, um, the the author was famously declared dead at one point in in recent memory uh, of of literary studies, and the author has come back with a vengeance for those who are interested in trends in in literary studies. Um, and this is part of our fascination now with uh, with the kind of personal lives and moral character of um, of content creators. Um, yeah. So every you know you always want I spend plenty of time on the podcast and, and elsewhere um, talking about, you know, why T.S. Eliot might have been in the state of mind to write The Wasteland or to what have you. Um, so it's not to say that those kinds of questions aren't interesting, can't help us to understand, um, and that there isn't an interesting kind of conversation to be had about how much of that should be allowed to influence our reading of the poem. However, it does get very, very uh, overwrought at times. Yeah. And there is something about not knowing Homer or not knowing Shakespeare that make those two particular corpora, those two particular kind of bodies of literature, give them their quality of being carved out of marble for all time, you know, right. just being this, this thing that comes from the gods. Right. Well, Spencer, we, unfortunately, we've, we've come to the end of the hour. It's four o'clock and wow. it's flown by. Uh, because it's been such a rich conversation. And I want to thank you very much for joining us today and for joining us at, at, at the Humanities Forum and for agreeing to this uh, slightly, <laughs> slightly difficult uh, way of doing things in, in, our, in our era. Uh, but, but you've been great and, and it's been great to have you and we're very happy that you joined us today. So I want to thank you very much. It has been such a privilege and a blessing. Thank you for your uh, conversation. Thank you to the students who are here. I can't see you over Zoom, uh, but I loved your questions and I'm really glad that you were here for this. Um, I think there will be information given about this at, at, in, in just a moment. Um, but I would say that if you have other questions, uh, you can get my contact information um, from from pat or from anybody really uh and send them in i am like only so good at answering emails but i will definitely try and um if you want to please just indicate in your question um that you would be happy for that question to become a mailbag question on my podcast young heretics because right. i do often answer questions about lit at the end of each uh episode and i'm always looking for new stuff to talk about Great. there yes I, I i should we should say that Please, please listen to Spencer uh, wherever you get your podcast. Listen to Young Heretics podcast. It's a great podcast. Um, and, uh, and, and please, everyone, thanks for coming today and enjoy your own studies of the Iliad and the Odyssey in the weeks ahead. 
Spencer, thank you again for joining us. It was it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Have a good weekend. You as well. <laughs> take care. Bye.